Hi everyone, Eric Prince here, Editor-in-Chief of Marion West. I'm joined today by Professor William Jacobson of Cornell Law School and the founder of the well-known blog, Legal Insurrection. So Professor Jacobson, thanks for uh, speaking with me. Great for inviting me, I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, so maybe just to get started, obviously things are still being tabulated and uh, but we had a pretty big election last night. And from a right of center perspective, I think a lot of people are maybe a little surprised of what's going on, but also you're sitting in the state of New York, which although some ballot measures and went a certain way and the attorney general looks to hang on, Lee Zeldin comes just short, but there's been some bright spots and house races in the state of New York as well. That's right. Ithaca continues to be in a red district now because the um, uh, used to be part of New York 23 and they redid all the districts. So we're now in a different district that kind of runs east from Ithaca and the Republican won, not by a lot, but, but won. So that was a pleasant surprise. And I don't know the exact count, but I read someplace that Republicans may win close to half of the congressional districts in New York. If, if it's anything close to that, that's amazing. The Democrats really shot themselves in, their, in the foot because they had such an outrageous map that they proposed and passed that the courts threw it out and had a neutral expert draft a more fair map. And so uh, I think Lee Zeldin's strength, I think he only felt 250,000 votes short, which is amazing. Uh, I think pulled a lot of people out to vote who might not otherwise have voted. So New York may end up being the factor along with Florida. Now, Florida was straight redistricting, but in New York, it was much more complicated. Could be what puts Republicans over the top and gets them control of the House. Yeah, so just before we recorded this, I saw Nate Kahn from the New York Times uh, tweeted that if the Republicans should continue to hang on to the House, that likely the state of New York and those congressional races will be the reason. I, I think so, because, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's so, just so humorous because it didn't have to be that way. They had just pr proposed a mildly, uh, you know, partisan map. It would have probably flown through and survived court challenge, but it was so outrageous what the Democrats tried to do. I think they tried to eliminate five or six Republican seats and take Republicans down to four out of 22 seats in the in the state and Republicans may end up getting eight to 10 of that 22. So I think I think that will be a huge difference. And that obviously affects the fate of the nation, because whether you control the House by one vote or by 10 or by 40, obviously, you'd rather control it by 40. You control the House. That means you control the committees, which means you control what legislation gets brought to the floor. There's all sorts of power to stymie a president, as we saw Democrats do during the Trump administration, just endless investigations. And there's really not a lot you can do to stop it. So hugely important, usually sig significant, but nationally, so far at least, it was a disappointment. It is possible, it's apparently likely now that Republicans will gain control of the House. So that's significant. And there's a possibility they could gain control of the Senate. I think they just have to win two out of the three of Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia. Nevada, the Republican is winning, although mail-in ballots, you never know what shows up. Uh, Arizona, incredibly, I just checked before we came on, they still only have about two thirds of the vote accounted for reporting. And so Blake Masters is down by 90,000 votes, which is gonna be hard to overcome. Carrie Lake by comparison for governor is only down 10,000. So she'll probably win because most of what's out there is same day votes and same day ballots and things like that that tend to favor Republicans. Uh, and Herschel Walker, it's now going to a runoff. So there's a decent chance the Republicans still may control the Senate. And again, if you control it by one vote, you control the Senate, you control the committees, you control everything. But that's tougher. You've got to get two out of three of those outstanding races. Uh, but that's an important point, especially sort of in this day and age. We saw how much the Democrats have accomplished with sort of the narrowest of majorities and a pretty stark contrast from 2009, where we saw the difficulty they had in the Senate side of passing what would become the Affordable Care Act with 60 votes by December uh, of that year. But it's sort of amazing 
at this point, what one can do with the smallest of margins. If you control the presidency, if you don't control the presidency, you can block a lot, you can stop a lot. Uh, and if you do control the pre presidency, the same uh, party, then you know, you can get stuff done. Not as much as you'd like with a bigger majority, but you can get stuff done. Uh, so obviously we're going to be kind of turning the conversation to your project of criticalrace.org momentarily, but just uh, briefly. So yesterday afternoon, sort of before the tally started coming in, uh, a number of prominent quit critics of what can we could broadly define as wokeism, uh, Christopher Rufo in particular, were saying for the past couple of years, Democrats have sort of... Uh, driven down our throats, so to speak, a lot of this agenda, and now they're gonna pay at the ballot box. So as we've discussed, there are a couple of bright spots, but it seems as though for a lot of people, expectations weren't met. You know, Governor Kemp is gonna win in Georgia, Ted Budd in North Carolina, but a lot of these races that were sort of up in the air, or bellwethers didn't break that way. It, what variables do you think at play? And is that sort of in any way a refutation of what sort of Christopher Rufo and others were projecting earlier in the evening? Well, I think it probably did have a huge impact in redder states in Florida. I think it was hugely impactful, the whole dispute over education. But in blue states, which is really where Republicans were hoping to make gains, I don't know that it played that big a factor. You know, in New York State, I don't know that it played that big a factor. So I think where you have governors who are sympathetic and legislators who are sympathetic and populations who are attuned to this, I think it did have a huge impact. I don't know that Florida would have gone almost 100% Republican without the education issue, without DeSantis becoming the um, uh, champion of fighting wokeism, whether it's Disney or in the school districts. I haven't seen reports on what happened with school boards around the country. I know there was a fair, fairly intensive effort to uh, turn over school boards. I, I just haven't seen reporting on that. So I think it had an impact, but it's not going to have an impact in California and Illinois and New York, places where Republicans were hoping to pick up seats. Um, they did pick up seats in New York, but other places like that. So I, I'd say it was a mixed bag, but I do think the parents' movement was hugely important, but it didn't swing districts in blue states. Uh, so as a lot of people know who kind of follow what I've been working on recently, I've been very interested in this idea of the left and medicine and medical school. So this is actually what prompted um, my sort of reaching out to you, Professor Jacobson, because your project, uh, criticalrace.org, and for those who don't know, uh, Professor Jacobson and his team have assembled in a very, what I like about it is it's very easy to sort of digest because I like maps and it's in map form and you can sort of go from state to state to see what's going on. And criticalrace.org, uh, uh, at the moment, I believe you have for what you call sort of elite private schools, universities, military academies, and medical schools, and sort of what's going on there in terms of what sort of the activist left is working on. So maybe if we could begin with you talking about medical schools and how you, because I think me and you, and obviously I had Heather McDonald on a couple of weeks ago, and we've, a lot of people have been kind of waking up to the reality that uh, I think a lot of these trends are concerning in a lot of places, but to, for me and to a lot of people, medicine is particularly concerning because the stakes are so high of life and death. So what got you kind of plugged into the medical school aspect when sort of everybody knows about the universities, but I think fewer people maybe know about what's going on in medical schools. Well, We've covered some of this material at Legal Insurrection more as news or investigative sort of articles. So we served a Freedom of Information or New York FOIL Freedom of Information Law request on SUNY Upstate Medical Center, mm -hmm. SUNY Upstate University, I think, Medical University, it's actually called. The sure. medical centers where they treat you, the university is the medical school. And because we, we got a tip from somebody who's a medical student there, about all the stuff that's going on. And then we ended up having to fight a court fight with them, even to get the documents. It took a year in court to get the documents and it confirmed a lot of what we believe. So before we started criticalrace.org, we were already attuned to what was going on in medicine. And so the first database we rolled out was the general university and college database. And that was in February of 2021 
We started with 220 schools and ran it up to where it's now over 500. The second one that we looked at, I believe, was the elite private K through 12. And that came to our attention again, just through connections, people we know telling us that, you know, there's a lot of focus on public schools, but it's actually worse in the elite private schools. The schools 100%. that, schools that um, you know, National Association of Independent Schools affiliates. Uh, that it, and so we started to look into that. Uh, and uh, then someplace along the way, we said, what about the medical schools? Because we had this litigation going on with SUNY Upstate Medical Center. And so we're currently at 50 medical schools. We just took, I don't remember which service it was, whether it was US News or something else, the top research medical schools and covered them, wrote it up, did an analysis, got publicity about it. And I say by the end of the year, probably by early December, we'll roll out the next piece, which is uh, the top 100 medical schools with an analysis. And all we do for the medical schools is what we do for the colleges and the others, which is we find out what they say they do. Okay, that's, the, everything is linked. So it's basically going to their websites and their social media accounts and what are they saying they're doing? And the thing that's great about universities, uh, they love to brag about this stuff. Yeah, that's so what I was gonna say. They're probably <laughs> proud of it. It's not like they're trying to find it. They're like, look at us. That's right. And you know, university websites can be quite complex because you have the university website, the college website, the department website. So you have to do some work, but it's there for the taking. The private schools were more difficult. While they do publish some of this, they don't publish a lot, but if you dig enough, usually their social media is the most informative place you can get. Um, and for the medical schools, they also have it available. And we do draw on resources that other organizations who are researching medical schools have, have found and written about. And so the medical schools, as bad as the colleges are, as bad as the private, elite private schools are, I think the medical schools are the worst. And, and I try to explain this to people that you, you have no idea what is going on in medical school, how uh, the indoctrination and the demand for uh, you know, racialization of medicine is so intense in medical school. Now it's a little different because if you don't like what's going on at a college, you pick a different college. There are very few medical schools and basically you go to any place that accepts you. So you really don't have a choice. And so that's what we do. And, and it's really horrible. And uh, we've done other things with regard to that, but it's very deeply embedded, the racialization of medicine. So what do you think is mostly driving that? Because you hit on a really important point. And as, as you said, as bad as things are at colleges, I think there are a few sort of exceptions. You can maybe go to Hillsdale. I don't know how things are currently at the University of Chicago, but historically they were a little more interested in free speech, but it seems as, and this is something Heather and I talked about, that in medical schools, it's pretty much across the board. Do you think that's mostly being driven by accreditation bodies, by sort of some of these NIH grants that people talk about for research? Sort of what is causing this amazing group think in medical schools that I think is even more pronounced than say at colleges? And obviously you know more about this and I welcome your thoughts, but maybe even at law schools. Well, I think it's all of the above. I think it is accrediting agencies, I think there's public pressure, and there's the DEI industrial complex, which right. are, are the uh, consultants and the, uh, I mean, at SUNY Upstate Medical Center, they spent, I think it was a year having somebody write up a report on what their action plan is going to be for DEI. Uh, they had committees, uh, and a lot of this is post-George Floyd. So anybody who has followed this, it's not that the concepts are new, it's not that DEI is new, but the George Floyd death really provided people the um, ability to enforce these things and to make them mandatory. And that's always the distinction we make is that there's a huge difference between mandating something and having it available for people who choose to study it. And that's really where we've always drawn the line that mandating somebody take this coursework, which is not connected really to medical school, mandating that they do go through these sometimes uh, insulting and abusive trainings, that's really where it crosses a line. So, uh, you know, that's really what we're seeing is that it's 
from every direction, people who are in the middle of these things, and I see it at Cornell, it's coming from everywhere. It's coming from the administration. It's coming from, particularly when you have a state school, they want to show that they're, you know, doing this for the, the politicians. And so it's come, people talk about it, it's almost like it's swarming. Okay. It's coming from every direction and it has captured, completely captured institutions, including Cornell University uh, and including SUNY Upstate Medical Center or Medical University, I should say. So I've visited Cornell a few times, but I'm not super intimately involved with kind of what's going on among the faculty and such. But would you be able to maybe provide a timeline of since you've been there, kind of how things have progressed in certain directions and, you know, I don't know, obviously you're very vocal in a lot of circles and on Twitter and a lot of places are people, you know, don't want to sit with you at lunch or whatever, not to get too personal, <laughs> but kind of like, what is the climate at Cornell these days? Yeah, well, those are a lot of questions. Timeline wise, um, I, and I might be confusing years. I mean, there's certain years and dates that I'm very clear on, um, but others, so maybe a year before George Floyd, could be a year and a half, I think it was in the fall, there were a series of incidents at Cornell that were then exploited by the administration to create an agenda and a essentially a administrative uh, impetus to this sort of stuff. One was a student reportedly shouted, build the wall outside the Latino house. Okay. And that was supposedly a racist incident. Okay. Um, what, what, um, I forget if which college publication, whether it was College Fix or somebody else, had a correspondent at Cornell who reported that it was a joke. It was actually a Latino liberal student mocking Donald Trump, not directing the comment in an abusive way towards the people who lived in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked the administration for comment on that. Like, can you confirm or deny uh, that this was actually a liberal Latino student shouting this as to mock Trump, not to abuse the students, because you're, you're using this incident as a mechanism to implement things. And they would neither confirm nor deny it. They would not provide any They're not. They have no interest in correcting the record or trying to get That's right. passionately to the bottom of what's going on. That's right. And so this was a huge blow up on campus. Um, it was during the Trump era. So build the wall was a big thing. And it was, right. and it really, it was all over the Cornell Sun newspaper. And that plus another incident where um, a black student in College Town, off campus, but in College Town, uh, got into a fight with, um, I think, a white student. And the N word was shouted, okay, that, and the student apologized for it. But it was portrayed as some fraternity brothers essentially hunting down and attacking a, a black student in College Town. Well, it turned out that um, while the student did admit using that slur, um, the aggressor was not the, the students, the white students, the, the black student actually attacked them. Um, and it was in the course of that fight and ran into their house. Um, and that was reported by the police. Was this black student a Cornell student? Yes, yes. And, uh, and that was reported by the police. I think it was corrected, correctly reported in the Cornell Sun and elsewhere. And of course, nobody's excusing the use of the slur, but the point is it wasn't as portrayed Right. in the local media and by the administration. Um, and so you had those two incidents that happened within maybe a month of each other. And that caused the administration to create a task force to look into these things. And uh, so that was kind of the background because you asked like, how did this start? So you have that as the background. And then of course you have George Floyd being killed and Cornell, like many other universities and corporations, uh, took that um, as to implement ev either, even further action. So the task force from a year or two earlier made some recommendations, but I don't know what they actually ended up doing with them. But this uh, is but all then in, in a somewhat recent amount of time. This is all yeah, past yeah. sort of yep. four or five years at the most. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that probably uh, it was obviously pre-pandemic, so I'm going to guess it was 2018, OK? 
Okay, something like that, maybe 2019. Sort of, and you know, know it through legal instruction as well as anyone, but we sort of, for a lot of people, there was this kind of Yale Halloween fiasco in 2015 that a lot of people sort of pointed to as maybe a type of inflection point. And, but it seems as though things got really accelerated, maybe with Trump as sort of a catalyst and- Yeah, yeah. And George Floyd I, I think push it that's over the true. Net. And so then in July of, 2020, after George Floyd, the president announced an anti-racism initiative on campus. And that really provides the context. And that actually was one of the things that led us to create criticalrace.org. So president announces um, an initiative, campus-wide initiative. She imposes certain trainings immediately on staff because she can, she's their boss. Uh, but faculty and students, you have this shared governance. So it had to go through the faculty senate uh, and it was uh, the recommended reading to help launch this initiative was Ibram Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. You got it. Never read. Really? Yes. University-wide, not mandatory read. It's right. a suggested summer reading. Every summer they have a book that they suggest everybody read. And then when you come back to campus, you have seminars on it, meetings and group sessions about it. And it was Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, which... I'd never heard of him or the book, but it was available for free if you had a Cornell ID. So I logged in and I started to read it. And I realized what Ibram Kendi is about. Is, and you're saying, you know, holy cow, what am I reading? How, yes, exactly. And so I actually wrote that up at Legal Insurrection about this new program they have. They're going to enforce trainings on staff immediately. They're going to, at, they're asking the faculty senate to approve trainings and education for faculty and students, because that has to be voted on by the Senate. It's ultimately the president's decision, but it, they wanted it to go through that process. And so I started to look into this and I said, you know, maybe I'll write an op-ed, maybe I'll write an article about it. And then we began to realize as we began to look at what was at other schools, how pervasive this was and how ingrained it was and how deep it was. And so we said, no, you know what? We've done a fair amount of research. Let's create a separate website to track this. Um, actually, I should step back. We were considering what to do with it. And then in September, early September of 2020, several hundred, I don't, can't tell you how many hundreds, more hundreds than I wanted to count. So it could have been 400, could have been 600, could have been 800, but a lot of faculty, students, and staff and some alums, but mostly faculty, student, and staff, signed a demand letter, open demand letter to the president of the university as to what they thought her anti-racism initiative should include. And it included things such as um, use of race for hiring and promotion, mm -hmm. essentially quotas. Right. Uh, had some very bizarre provisions, better tracking of race, race on campus, and I, I, to this day, I don't understand it. They wanted a tracking of the race of spouses who were hired. I'm not really sure what the logic was there. And so it's a multi-page document set of demands if you've, you know, that often get issued on campuses. And that's when I said, you know what, this thing is so out of control. Nine law professors have signed it, have uh, prominent professors on campus, or at least people whose name I knew, you know, I knew of them have signed a document calling for illegal conduct, for conduct that clearly violates our anti-discrimination laws, which is uh, promotion and hiring based on race. And so that's when we made the decision to create the separate website and it started. And so that's kind of the background as to how it all got started and how it started at Cornell. Oddly enough, shockingly enough, uh, there actually was pushback in the faculty senate to uh, mandatory trainings and mandatory education. Uh, and it ended up with, after lengthy sessions, reports, I normally don't go to the faculty senate things, but you could right. with, an, with a Cornell ID log in online and listen to it. Actually, I'm not sure you even needed an ID. Uh, so I did participate in this. I submitted comments, things like that uh, against it. And shockingly, it ended up being about a 50-50 split. Uh, I don't think any, and then they, you, in classic academia, <laughs> two resolutions passed by a plurality, um, one supporting the mandatory training and one opposing it. 
<laughs> so it was a complete model. But the end result is they passed this along to the president who said, well, there's no clear mandate from the Senate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this down to the school level because you've got, you know, different schools at Cornell. And uh, that's it's kind of gone under the radar. But I think that was a, a big blow to the people opposing it, because now it, there's no sunlight on it. When it was at the faculty Senate, it was very transparent. Right. Everything was recorded. Okay. And so I, I, this is what the, the atmosphere at campus is full on DEI, full on Ibram Kendi anti-racism and faculty and a lot of students are 100 percent behind it. Of course, the majority aren't, but nobody's going to speak up uh, because right. of the consequences. Well, that's a point I wanted to touch on. And I've over the past couple of years talked to a lot of people who are in uh, various facets of academia, most notably kind of I've been focusing on people in STEM broadly defined, because for a long time, people thought, well, you know, like they say, it can't happen here, but um, it has. But one through line that almost everyone brings up is it's not really broadly popular, but either through, as you said, through a lack of sunlight or a vocal sort of minority of 38 percent or whatever it kind of gets rammed through and um i guess people talk about this all the time but it seems like uh there could be some pretty clear consequences for not going along with it for example my last guest dr stanley goldfarb from the university of pennsylvania whom you may have heard about his case so obviously he was opposed to certain things going on at the university of pennsylvania medical school and there's change.org petitions to ask for his head and such. And he was making a really interesting kind of practical point that medicine is inherently collaborative. And all of a sudden you're kind of a node in a system and all of a sudden people don't want to interact with you anymore. And it's kind of hard in that case. So what are the sort of consequences that go along for people on campus who speak out? Or secondly, what are some of the factors that prevent one from speaking out in the first place? Well, I, I think it's multifaceted. Uh, first of all, Cornell, I'm not sure when it started, but I only found out about it maybe a year ago, but it could have been in place earlier, uh, now requires DEI statements for all new hires and all promotions, faculty new deal. hires and promotions. And, uh, not only, and there's a rubric actually published on the university website in one of their bureaucracies devoted to this stuff, which tells university uh, units how they should evaluate DEI statements. And what's particularly pernicious about it is that you not only have to essentially pledge allegiance to the group identity core of DEI, um, you also have to show how you have incorporated it into your career. So it not only forces people to adhere to an ideology, uh, which I, advances the concept of justice by group racial group terms as opposed to individual equal protection and fair treatment, but it also requires you tailor your career to show that you've done it if you want to get a good grade on your DEI statement. So it's extraordinarily pernicious. Uh, it's mostly flown under the radar. I've heard some professors said, I've never heard of this thing. So there may be some departments that don't really follow it, but it is university policy. You must have a DEI statement with every application. Uh, so that's one way that it's invaded the campus and imposed an ideology on the campus. The other way is there have been a number of fairly high profile incidents where people who spoke out with regard to the George Floyd protests and riots have been targeted by the administration. So there was a chemistry professor who shortly after George Floyd was killed, when the rioting was going on, there was an incident in Buffalo, New York, where an older protester approached a line of police. The police, um, he got like right up on them. They sure. pushed him back. They didn't throw him down. They didn't, it wasn't, it was more like an arm's length extending the arms. And if it had been a younger person, they probably would have been fine. But this older guy stumbled backwards, then tripped over his own feet, hit his head on the pavement. Got a lot of publicity. And this chemistry professor, who's fairly prolific on Twitter, basically in a snarky way, said, you know, he shouldn't have approached the cops. He shouldn't have been there. He got what he asked for. Um, and the police did nothing wrong. Well, you had the 5,000 or 10,000 signature change.org petition. The Cornell Sun issued an editorial calling for him to be fired. And then something that is the worst. I mean, we've covered dozens and dozens of these cases that I've seen 
the entire senior administration of the university signed a letter denouncing him, including the president, the provost, two senior vice presidents, one of whom I think was for student affairs. And I've never seen this. The police chief signed that denunciation saying no reasonable person could think this was appropriate police action and police conduct. Um, they didn't fire him because in the statement they say, well, you know, he has tenure and this was an off-campus statement about a matter of public importance and it's protected by academic freedom. But we're going to denounce him anyway and we're going to call him all sorts of names. And uh, so fast forward a year later, the police are cleared by an investigation. They brought in outside investigators and they said the police did nothing wrong. The guy shouldn't have been in the area. It was a closed area. He approached the police. He reached for the policeman's belt. And it was appropriate for the policeman to literally give an arm's length, pushing him away. Uh, and so no charges were going to be filed. So I emailed the administration. I said, are you going to issue a, an apology to the chemistry professor? No response. Um, about two weeks after that, um, the same sort of mob mentality found me because I wrote a blog post uh, watching the rioting and the looting and the protests, people marching, saying, hands up, don't shoot. And I recognized that immediately because that's the Black Lives Matter motto since the days of Michael Brown shooting, hands up, don't shoot. And because we followed the formation of the Black Lives Matter movement and the Ferguson riots and the shooting and death of Michael Brown, I was intimately familiar with it that that never happened, okay? Uh, not only did the local prosecutor say it didn't happen, so did Eric Holder's Justice Department under Barack Obama did a, a civil rights investigation and found there's no credible evidence that that happened. Of course, you can't prove something didn't happen, but there's no credible evidence to suggest it. In fact, Michael Brown was shot because he sucker punched the policeman who was sitting in a patrol car to try to steal his weapon. And all of the forensics justified that. There was um, residue from the barrel of the gun on Michael Brown's hand. Uh, and so that was the first shot. Policeman got out of the car to confront him. Brown made a second charge at the policeman and that was the fatal shot. So I knew this was fabricated and I had written two to three times over the last several years, a post saying this is a fabrication. And so after George Floyd's death, when I'm seeing people marching like this, I wrote a post that said, reminder, and I said reminder because I'd written about it before, the hands up, don't shoot is a fabricated narrative from the Michael Brown case. Right. Um, and uh, people absolutely lost their minds at Cornell Law School. Um, uh, there was an alumni petition to get me fired. Uh, 21 of my colleagues denounced me. Um, the uh, dean denounced me. 15 student groups organized a boycott of my course, which I'll say failed. Um, it had no impact on my enrollment, yeah. but they tried. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is the atmosphere at Cornell. And, and it was the same sort of thing as with the chemistry professor. Well, I don't have tenure. I had a different sort of job protection that because he has job protection, there's nothing we can do. Well, what message does that send to everybody on campus, to all the people who don't have job protection, which is you don't speak out about these things. So that's the atmosphere at Cornell. People, I received a huge outpouring of support from students on campus, particularly in the law school, who said, you know, don't think that these loudmouths speak for everybody. They don't. The problem is you have a lot of support. The problem is everybody's afraid to say anything. And so, you know, that was the atmosphere in the summer. And I think, you know, things have, I think the pandemic probably calmed things down, but there was a, a while when there was very aggressive student activism targeting other students. And I know that because I'm the faculty advisor to most, if not all right of center undergraduate student groups, even though I'm, I don't teach undergrad. Uh, and so I would hear these reports of really horrific harassment that the university would do nothing about. Uh, I've spoken to parents who get involved. Is there anything we can do? These activists are literally tracking down my son, trying to get him kicked out of clubs, et cetera. Really? Uh, yep. Yeah. And that's all of, under the radar, all under the radar, never reported because they wanted privacy. But I knew that they went, they turned to the university for help and got no help whatsoever. Uh, and, and so it is an atmosphere where people have learned the lesson to keep your mouth shut unless you're a DEI, quote unquote, anti-racism activist, you just keep your mouth shut on campus 
And that the anecdotes I've heard are confirmed by surveys, multiple surveys by the FIRE Foundation. It used to be Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. They've gone through a name change uh, that something 65 to 70 percent of Cornell students report that they don't feel free to express their views on campus. So that's the atmosphere at Cornell. I think it's not any different than most universities uh, that you look, you learn to keep your head down and keep your mouth shut and hopefully emerge from your four years at university without nasty stuff said about you on the internet. But then I guess nowadays you can emerge from those four years and go to company X or Y and now it's there too. That's right. I mean, it's, it's all of the, the, essentially the people who for a decade or more became used to this, became used to the speech codes became used to the bias response teams, became used to all of these things where everything revolves around, you know, free speech revolves around how it makes you feel, not the speaker's right to speak. And that is now in corporations. Again, George Floyd was a, a watershed moment for that where the DEI consultants and the various activist groups would put pressure on corporations and the corporations just wanted to buy peace. They didn't want protests. So they'll donate. And I, I saw reported in multiple outlets that uh, something like 50 billion, five zero billion with a B uh, of uh, pledges were made to various Black Lives Matter related sort of movements and uh, and you know it's it's a money making scheme for some people. Uh, it's a career for other people. Uh, people just don't realize how ingrained this is now in our educational system. One thing that strikes me is kind of what people focus on. So you mentioned this chemistry professor, and I, I don't know his name in particular, but I feel like if he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry, that that would be barely even discussed. Or if you contributed as I'm sure you do, a very important law article on your topic of expertise, and no one's kind of tweeting, 10,000 people aren't saying, good for Professor Jacobson for making this case, but if you tweet something about these sort of hot button issues, I guess everything is so myopic, and this lens and obsession with identity, and even if you're a chemist, if you're a literature professor, if you're a, writing a great poem, people don't really seem to care, but it's only if you just kind of sound off on these narrow range of issues. Yeah, I mean, we've seen so many, you know, the term now is cancel culture. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but that term really grew out of the post-George Floyd purges on in academia, where there was a professor down at University of Central Florida who um, had a tweet where he said, um, use the term black privilege. I forget what he was talking about. And that was the same thing, the 10,000 signature change.org petition, the protests outside of his house, protests on campus, participated in by the university president. Uh, and then they launch an investigation of him. They know they can't fire him for his tweets. It's a public university and that's First Amendment applies. Uh, so they launch a seven month investigation of him and put a, a team of lawyer, a team of investigators on him and go back 20 years. He's been there 15, 20 years and start interviewing people and drumming up gripes literally from 12 years ago that were never made and use that as an excuse to fire them. Took them to union arbitration and got reinstated. But the point is, this, is, this was a purge that was going on throughout the summer of 2020 to try to kick out any faculty or students who spoke against what was going on. And that was, it was really, there were a lot of incidents in that, those two months. I think the fire said, uh, I know the people who work there, I've, I've met them. And they said, and I think this is public, they've put it in their promotional materials. That summer, I think they got more reports of people being canceled than they would in a normal year. So in two months, they got more than a year's worth of, of reach outs from people. It was a terrifying thing on campuses where literally mob mentality governed everything. I think one of the things that kept it from getting more violent uh, was that many schools, including, including Cornell, were on lockdown were because of COVID. So we weren't in session. I think my incident might have proceeded a little differently, more aggressively, had we all been in the building, but we weren't. 
Nobody was in the building. Nobody could be in the building in June of 2020. Uh, and so that probably tempered things a lot around the country, uh, but it was a bad, bad summer. Uh, and I know a lot of people, we've reported on them at Legal Insurrection, who were given very difficult times and put in some cases in danger. I mean, having people protesting outside your house, that's right. pretty scary. I think that's a very important point is this sort of veil of violence of coming to someone's yeah. house. And we saw that a little bit with the Supreme Court where it's no longer just tweets on a screen. You're at someone's house. And as we saw with, with the Kavanaugh case, it seems as though things are really uh, slipping in a dangerous direction. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. And I think that that's been a tactic for a long time. Uh, and I, I think it's only going to get worse. I mean, doxing people, doing things like that is, you know, the lifeblood of Twitter. <laughs> you know, it's the lifeblood of social media uh, to do that sort of stuff. So, you know, it's, I think in many ways, social media, if I look back, so I've been at Cornell for 15 years, I was in private law practice before that that things have gotten worse. I mean, there's no question. And yes, of course, 15 years ago, there was social media, but never at the penetration uh, and never at the politicization that it has been probably the last five to six years. I think you could mark the ascendancy of Donald Trump to the hyper aggressiveness of people attacking others uh, via social media and cancel culture and things like that. So things, things are a lot worse now and people live in fear because they don't want to lose their job. Uh, yeah, um, because I think there's been this perception for a long time that's accurate of sort of this left of center bias on university campuses, but now it seems like it's gone just kind of beyond the pale. Yeah, well, if you look at Cornell, uh, the statistics that... Um, the Cornell Sun has studied political donations from faculty, and it's approaching 100% of the political donations from faculty to candidates a lot of or to Democrats. Too, as a lot of people saw in the, this past election cycle, we saw Twitter and Oracle and all of these companies, and it's just staggering. It seems like almost all of the sort of, we're talking about the medical schools, the accreditation body, sort of all the means of kind of power are moving in that direction. Yeah, I mean, you know, I laugh somewhat when I hear about, you know, all these claims of, you know, right-wing dark money and right-wing activist groups. As somebody who studies what's happening in universities as well as working on one and happening in education, the money and the power is almost entirely on the leftist side, okay? The, the dollar flows, you know, we do a lot with parents and with teachers and the um, book publishers and the unions and um, the foundations. I mean, people don't realize that name brand foundations, the Ford Foundation, other foundations like that fund a lot of this stuff. Sure. There are tens of billions of dollars flowing towards left-wing activist groups and activism every single year. It dwarfs what happens on the right many times over, not even close. And so uh, it, it really is a, is a tough situation. Things have gotten very, very bad. There are no lines. Every line's been crossed. When you're protesting on someone's front step uh, because you don't like their tweet, then all the lines have been crossed. Uh, so last question, uh, Professor Jacobson. So last question I asked Heather McDonald too, and I, I won't prejudice you with her answer, but you <laughs> sort of uh, outlined a pretty troubling state of affairs. Uh, you, but at the same time, through your actions, you're personally invested, obviously, in doing your best to reverse the course. Are you optimistic that things can be uh, reversed? And this actually sort of circles back to how we began the conversation of these election results uh, that are maybe since we began this conversation have now shored up more, but kind of where's your state on thing, state of um, mind and where things are headed or could head? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not optimistic at all that campuses can be reformed. They certainly cannot be reformed from within when you will only hire people who adhere to your ideology and you enforce it through various mechanisms on campus to keep people in line. Uh, when you build up bureaucracies whose livelihoods depend on this, 
I, I don't think there is any way that campuses can be reformed from within. Could they be made a little better? Yes. And I'm all in favor of various groups, usually alumni who are working to try to promote free speech on campuses. I'm all in favor of that. But I would say to you what I say to them when they ask me, it's gone. It, academia is gone. Um, if you look at the, it, it is a monoculture. It is a uh, hermetically sealed bubble uh, that I don't know what the answer to it is, but if you think donating money is going to get these administrators to change their ways, I think you're going to be very surprised. I think alternatives need to be presented um, to universities for students to get education, essentially parallel structures, very hard to do. But there are groups who provide, ed who don't try to replace the university, but make their facilities available near campus and provide alternative education, support, different things like that. Uh, and of course, political pressure is going to have to. And of course, the universities will scream bloody murder about academic freedom. But there is no academic freedom for the most part on campuses. You only have the academic freedom to agree with the prevailing ideology on campus. So this is a situation universities have created. And I think that they're now gonna scream when there's outside pressure, but that's the only way anything is ever gonna change. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Jacobson. I know sort of a, some somber topics, but I appreciate your really level-headed analysis on them. So thanks so much for uh, speaking with me today. Great, thanks for having me on. Of course.